Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of our friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Mm. Oh. And today's guest, we've got Big Paul Venice. James. How are you, brother? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Good to see you. No, yeah, man. You'll have a mad roller coaster of a life, brother. Prison, right. fighting, changed your life. Yeah. Proud of you. Thank you very much, mate. Big steps, man. Like, you're doing amazing things. We'll plug your YouTube channel straight away as well. What is that? Appreciate that. Uh, Paul Venice K1. And I hear if you and Danny Christie get 10,000 subscribers each, you're going to fight each other. We're getting it on. We're getting it on. Yeah, it's going to be a. Listen, I have too much love and respect for that man to ever want to bring any harm to him. But. Uh, you know, he said he's prepared to pick himself up the canvas, so that tells me he's going to be doing everything he can to fucking <laughs> land a shot on us. So, and obviously he's no mug, so yeah, we're excited and looking forward to it. Yeah, shout out to Danny, man, he's done Big well. shout out to Danny, love him, love him to bits, my um, brother and friend. He's own, he owns his misery, he owns his pain, and yeah. that's not easy to do, and yeah. I think people are starting to respect him a bit more, and, and it seems to be a new chapter for him, which is a good yeah. thing to see. Long may it continue. <laughs> but I always go back to the stick start with my guest, brother. Yeah. Where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, so <clears throat> I grew up in Middlesbrough, South Bank, a little rough town. Uh, you know, I was a tubby ginger kid, two different coloured eyes. Uh, bullied bad, like picked on bad to the point where when I, when I, no, my, my dad was a bodybuilder and one, he was a big man. Wasn't a, a fighter all that, but he was a respected man. Everyone knew him, you know, everyone knew my mum. And he was a big dude and he was just constantly back and forth to the school, seeing kids' parents and, you know, like, trying to put a stop to it, but it just, it just couldn't, you know what I mean? Kids could be nasty, can't they, do you know what I mean? And I just got tortured to the point where I was crying every morning, didn't want to go, you know, and uh, he got that frustrated. He was just like, but he, he had bad enough. And he was like emotional, putting something in my bag and said, he fucking hurt him. Go, to, go there and do, but my mum was like, no, no, he can't do that. And he took it back out. He was like, I'm sorry, son, I shouldn't have done that. But it was just an emotional time for him, do you know what I mean? To see his son going through this, you know, this misery of life, you know, to the point where, you know, I was a child, I was like seven, eight, nine year old and wondering what it would be like to kill myself. You know, looking in the mirror, not liking what I was seeing, believing the words of the bullies. You know, that was a monster with two different coloured eyes, a ginger hair. You know, I was fat. You know, I uh, believed all that. You know, and then laying in bed on my night and, you know, wondering, wondering what it would be like to die. And, you know, and I just knew, like, looking back now, it's not normal, is it, for a kid to be thinking like that, do you know what I mean? And, you know, I just knew he was doing the work, what I know now. I was born different. I had something wrong with me, and like not meant like physically, but just up there. You know, kids shouldn't be obsessing around shit like that. You know what I mean? And you know, uh, <clears throat> I remember um, moving on a little bit. You no, know, still getting picked on, and you know, but I was I was a decent footballer. I was banging at my sports. You know, and I was good. I was good at football. I was good at running. I was good at swimming. I was all. I was quite athletic, quite good. You know, for my for my weight and my size, I was always bigger than every other kid. You know, but I was just afraid to fight, afraid to hit back, afraid to get hurt. You know, and it took its toll on me. And, uh, you know, it was just a time through primary school, James, you know what I mean? And um, I remember being about nine, ten year old. And uh, do you remember them old catapults? Like the plastic, with the rubber, the crap. Yeah, yeah, they were yeah. about 50 pence when we were kids. Johnny Poppers, I think. We used yeah, to well, them. we used to call them gatties. Catapults, gatties. Yeah. We used to call them that. There was a big, massive market in South Bank. And they were about 50 pence. So me and me two and me pals managed to, we scraped, we all got 50 pence each. We went and got one, you know, and then we, the, where the path was, it's called the lines. And it was like the best stones in South Bank where this path was all these, you know, these like uh, dolly you know, the stones. Yeah, they were mint. So we're like, oh, we'll go up there. And I was like, I'm not allowed up there. My mum and dad said, I'm not allowed up there. 
So we're like, oh, wait, we'll just go up no one no more. So I was like, all right, sound. So we, this path is proper secluded, James. It's behind loads of warehouses. It's proper secluded, massive bushes hanging over it. And you walk right to the top and it's got a, a bridge. And obviously, the car's going on go over the top. But you're under this bridge, you're proper out of the way. No, it, it's just it's just proper secluded. Anyway, so we were grabbing these stones and we were firing them over the bridge and watching them come down the other side. Obviously, some of them weren't coming down. There was cars going across, so... But we were not a wise, you know what I mean? I was proper young, like proper little. And uh, obviously, some of the stones weren't coming down. So now, looking back, obviously, they were in cars. We didn't know. And uh, next thing you know, I'm just stood under this bridge. And the, the bridge was steep. You know, to climb down off the side of the road, you, to climb down, it's quite dangerous. This bloke was climbing down, big bloke, was climbing down the side of it. And, I thought, and, he, and he was in a rush to get down. And me, stupid, didn't realise that like, he's probably coming for us here. But I didn't realise my two mates, poof, off. And I was like, where he's going? And he just, poof, just killed me. And he just proper battered me, do you know what I mean? Like proper levered me to the point where I'd lost control of my bowels. You know, he'd smash my face and he'd punch to me, jumping on my head, picking me above his head, slamming me on the floor. You know, he beat me like a grown man, you know, and I was only a child. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking, poof, yeah, this man's going to kill me here. And uh, I managed to get on my feet. I don't know how. I don't know how. For the grace of God, I got on my feet. And there was still about two mile into the um, estate, through, out this path. And this bloke chased me. Once I did my feet and was off, he chased me with his fingers on my back, telling me he's going to kill me, all the way to the open. And when I got out in the open, I was just like, whoosh, whoosh, like I was just glad I got out. You know, I'm obviously pissing shit, shit myself. And, you know, I was that frightened. I, I just knew it, was, it just wasn't normal what was happening to me then, do you know what I mean? Even though I was so young. And when I come out into the estate, my two pals were sat at the end. And when they got close to me, they both just broke down, started crying. No, because obviously my face was mashed in and, you know, I was bleeding out my ear and, you know, I was in a polite state and I didn't realise how bad I was because adrenaline it took over. I was just gone. And I was just out of panic and getting all dizzy and getting all sick. And, you know, I was, end up falling over, collapsing and stuff like that. They managed to get me home. But I remember him dragging me home and I was just begging him, saying, listen, please don't tell my dad what's happened. Tell him I fell off a wall. Tell him I fell off a wall because... Obviously, they weren't that strict on me. I never got beat up as a child. They were, they were just loving, genuine loving parents. Do you know what I mean? I was well loved and, you know, and I just, I just didn't want to disappoint them, you know, to, to say like I was up there and this is this has happened. I thought they would go mad at me. You know, as, as a child, I just thought that's what they would have thought. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so I managed to convince my dad that I'd fell off this wall or a skip. I can't really remember because it was a long time ago, but I told him I'd fell off some head fest smashed all my face and so I went to hospital was in hospital for a few days and you know my head my face was mashed in and you know eye sockets and all that stuff was mashed in and anyway um this is how young I was James because about six five or six weeks later I decided to tell my dad what had happened I just thought shall I tell him so I'm in the bath and he's washing my hair with a jug you no know, sort of soap didn't go in my eyes put your head back son like that's washing my hair just and I thought when I think back I thought bloody hell I must have been young you know, I've got kids and I've washed their hair with the jugs and that, you know what I mean? You stop doing it when you're about 10, 11, don't you? You wash your own hair, you know, but that's how young I was, you know, and I just remember saying to him, do you remember when I said I fell off that wall, Dad? He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, some man battered me. Oh, man, it was horrible. You know, because I've got kids myself, James, you know, and I, like my boy's, he's, my boy's 11, do you know what I mean? I couldn't imagine any man laying his, finger, laying his hands on him, do you know what I mean? And what I would do if they did. And uh, when I told him, Oh man, he just, he was gutted, man. Do you know, like he just broke down. He was, quick, out the bath, get out the bath. He wanted to instantly find who this, who this man was. Do you know what I mean? He was, where did it happen? I told him he's trying to drag me back up there. He's pointing at blokes, he's at him. No, he just was so desperate to find this man. You know, and he was like, why didn't you tell me, son? I was like, I thought you'd go mad because up there. He was like, son, you, you were only a little boy. You, no one should touch you like that. You shouldn't, you know, I was heartbroken. He was proper heartbroken. And uh, anyway, like, my, my point in telling you that story, James, is because the tr like when I realised, when I look back at like my life, the trauma that I had on me, you know, as a child, it changed me. But when I come into six weeks old, just to go into say, secondary school, it changed. It, it took away a little part of me where I thought, do you know what? Like I, I'm, I'm done here. Like I'm just, I'm just prepared to do what I've got to do. And I just started fighting back. Started getting kids back. You know, I wasn't taking no shit. And um, I remember my dad. He says, listen, son, he bought me this, I think it was a video player then, one of the VHSs, that's how old it was. And I'm not that old, am I? <laughs> anyway, he bought, I think it was even a video player. I can't, I don't know if it was a DVD. Anyway, he bought me this thing called The Fabulous Four. Thomas Ernst, Marvin Nagler, Roberta Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, 
<clears throat> and I was obsessed with it. Obsessed. He'd literally take me belly to what do you want to what do you want put on? I'd say fabulous four. He'd go again. I'd go again. And I would watch that over and over and over again. You know, and subconsciously I was probably studying it, you know, like as a child watching it over and over again, and you stood up on your bed jumping around like your bedroom and you both shot and punches and stuff like that. And then I remember being obsessed with this that being obsessed with it. When I've gone into secondary school, James, that was it. You know, the tables had turned. I was hitting kids back. I wasn't just dipping them, I was hurting them, you know, and then it felt good. The tables had turned, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not afraid to say that I probably turned into a bully, you know, like the, the trauma of getting bullied and getting them, what happened to me off that man, I just lost all fear and, not fear, but I lost my conscience, you know, I wasn't afraid to hurt someone and I didn't feel bad about it. Because you know? you, yeah, because you didn't want to feel the pain anymore? Yeah. Did you ever yeah. find out who that man was? Never. Never found out, never ever found out. You know, uh, do you think you could have died? I, as a child, I'm probably overthinking, like, was he going to kill me or not? But my memory of it, 100%. Like, I, I know, like, he definitely would have, you know, when the moment he punched me, James, like, I went absolutely flying on my ass, poof, and I knew he'd hit me and broke something straight away in my face. And at that moment, in time, when he picked me up, and I knew he was, he was absolutely going to go to town on me. I just lost control of my bowels. You know, like I just, I just, I in fear. I never stopped dreaming about that, you know, for a long time. Being embarrassed of, of losing my bowels as a child because of, because I was that frightened, you know, and even though no one knew, no one knew because I managed to get home and tidy myself up and, and do whatever, but even though no one knew, like it never left me. I was so embarrassed. Like, I, like I, it, it broke me as a, as a child, you know, and it, it, it done something to me. You know, and, and, and you know, I, I, doing the work now, where I'm at now, with in, in the stage I'm at in my life now, you know, having to let, having to do the work on stuff like that and let it go, um, I, I dare say it had a massive, massive effect on my personality going through my teens, you know, of being a horrible, nasty boy, do you know, to, to other kids or to other people, do you know what I mean? Yeah. On the way to building the reputation of the next... The next hard man, do you know what I mean? So see, when you're doing that and started bullying yourself, did you start feeling a sense of power or were you still scared behind the bullying? So the fear that I had, you know, the fear that I had was, uh, wasn't was fear of, of fighting or anything like that. It was just fear of getting beat again, getting, getting bullied again, you know, getting embarrassed again, losing my bowels again. It was just fear of being that child again and what I went through. You know, and that fear, I dare say that fear turned me into a monster and made me dangerous because I was so frightened that people finding out about that fear as well. You know, if someone mentioned the name, oh, he's hard, he's can fight or whatever, I was just like, Get, show me, where is he? You know, and, and it was just one of them. You know, and it was, the the, the reputation I was making for myself in the in the secondary school was was quickly enjoyable for me. You know, it was like a sense of power. It was... You know, I enjoyed being feared. I enjoyed, it's not so much liked, but in, in your head you like to think, ah, it's because he likes me because I'm a good lad. You know, but it's probably not, is it? Do you know what I mean? It's a lot of, yeah. What did you do after school? So funny enough, when I was in school and that, I was in and out of clubs, James, for football and that. But I was just never no good at school. I was always in trouble. I was a thief. I was a robber. I, I, no, I wasn't. I was just, I was a bad, bad kid, you know, I was doing some bad stuff. And um, but I was a good footballer. You know, I was in that with clubs. I was at Hartlepool for for a while. You know, I was playing for all the best teams. Every every team wanted me. You know, I was a good, good player. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up going to uh, Middlesbrough Soccer Academy, offered a scholarship for football, you know, got sponsorship deals, Adidas, and, you know, I was it was looking promising. You know, um, I was with a girl, my, my missus who I'm still with now, 21 years, my rock. Uh, we... I got I got with her when I was 14, 15, so she was the good girl. And I was the bad kid. You know, she was she wasn't we were total opposites, do you know what I mean? She was a proper good girl. And uh, she felt pregnant, 15, 16. And now I've got all this football stuff going on and you know, I want to be a pro football, I want to do this, I want to do that, but I'm also on the streets knocking about with all the kids, making door, you know, doing this, doing that, and dabbling. I never really took drugs till I was about 15, 16. But I started smoking weed, sniffing coke, and um I fucking loved it. You know, I loved it. It really, I really felt like I'd, I'd arrived. It took away that fear. It took, it, it changed. It, 
I don't know, it just done something to me, you know, it, it filled that hole, filled that gap that I, that I suppose I had. You know, um, Mary Mama, my missus was pregnant and I was getting offered, you know, this, this and this, come and do this, come and do that. So I thought, fuck football, I can make money now, I can do this, I can go do that for them. You know, so I practically fucked it off. I'm trying to play still, but my heart wasn't in it no more. You know, my, my, my mindset had swayed from being a professional footballer to just being a, a maniac on the streets, do you know what I mean? Like some, some the artist twat on, on the streets. Now I look back at that and when I've just said it there, I just thought, wow, you know, because I, I did have potential, you know, I was there wasn't many play, many pitches I was playing on where there was people better than me on, do you know what I mean? And that, that's not me blowing smoke on my own ass, just I was a good player, James, do you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, anyway, when she was pregnant, we were kids, you know, her dad was threatening to shoot me. My dad was supposed <laughs> to speak about As you do, mate, I'm the yeah, same. Yeah, well, I've got a couple of stories about me, me, me father-in-law. He's, 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 he loves me now. I think he loves me more than he loves. Took him twenty daughter. years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but he's, but he's old school. He's, uh, he's old school lunatic himself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But you're a good man. I love him a bit. Um, but my dad wasn't speaking to me because he was like, "You're gonna throw everything away. You're playing for Middlesbrough Soccer Academy, and you've got scholarships. You got this. What are you playing at? You can't do this." And I was like, "But I want it. I'm, I'm a man." And he's like, "You're not. You're a kid. What are you doing?" Their dad was doing the same. Me and they were planning, we we'll run away and all this, you know, as a kid, you know, and um, I was just kids having kids, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, it, it, it took a time. For, I mean, don't get me wrong, my, my oldest daughter now, she's 18 and, you know, she's best thing, one of the best things that have ever happened to us, you know what I mean? She, so it wouldn't change a thing. But uh, excuse me, I think it could have been planned better. Yeah. You know, I think that opportunities could have still been pursued, you know, around the football or around other things. You know yeah. I mean? So, but that's life. How much added pressure was that on you to try and provide for the family for such a young age? Massive. It was massive because my it, my head, my way of thinking was, well, I can go play football and, and wait another three years to maybe become something. But there's a let's have it right. It's, there's a small chance you're not going to be the next Cristiano Ronaldo or whatever. Do you know what I mean? There's a very small chance of that. But a couple of lads who I was playing with, they have made it, you know, playing for Hartlepool and they've they got a good life. Or you could go make 500 quid right now, come with me. I chose the 500 quid, you know what I mean? I chose the 200 quid, I chose the 500 quid, I chose, you know, just to go. And most of it went up my nose anyway. Do you think you would have chosen that path anyway, no matter what? Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm a strong believer, what's meant for you won't go around you. It's mm -hmm. simple as that. You know, it's, what the, it's the reason why I am who, who I am today, James, you know what I mean? Because it's the reason why I've, I've got the experiences around life of, 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 of living not and making the choices that I made then, do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't change a thing. I, I wouldn't because I, I'm all, I always think, imagine I hadn't been through that. I hadn't been all of, like made them choices. I could, there's a possibility I'd be making them now. My future, imagine making them choices when you're 40. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for what I've done and what I've made, do you know what I mean? I don't regret anything. If I start regretting it, it's just, Fucks with my head, you know what I mean? So it's just pointless. What was life like then, early 20s? Early Do you know what? When when I'd actually properly fucked football off around about 18, 19, no, 17, 18, I I was just playing for local teams now, you know, just a bit, bit of fun on the Saturday, mm -hmm. Sunday, turning up after a 24 hour bender and just having a game. George Best style. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I started getting into, because obviously I was I was a hard kid on them streets now. Everyone, everyone, knew me, you know, I was always wanting to fight the artist. I was all, you know, and there was, there was a twat round our way who passed away when he was 26, Lee Duffy. And everyone was on wanting, the, who's the next Lee Duffy? And, you know, my name was shot in the mix, or oh, he's going to be the next Lee Duffy. And I just thrived off it. I thrived off it. You know, I wanted to follow in his footsteps. He was my hero. You know, I loved sitting and listening to the stories. He was like, you know, he was, he was a proper superstar of the South Bank, Middlesbrough area. He was a superstar. And I just, I wanted to be, my life I wanted to be his Obviously, I just didn't want to die when I was 26, but I didn't didn't look forward to that far, do you know what I mean? I just thought, in the, right now, I am the next Lee Duffy. I'm going to be as hard as him. I'm going to be as fearless as him. And my reputation is going to be as big as his. That was all I was bothered about. So we got offered, um, we, were in a, uh, we were in a gym, we were in a pub having a few drinks, you know, and I'm sat there, roided up, big big lads, fucking thinking like I'm fighting all that. And there was a couple of Asian kids who were doing all the kickboxing gyms and that around South Bank, and they were like, come in. I was sound with them, like they were good lads and that. They said, oh, you, you can have a fight, can you, Ben? I went, yeah, well, I. He went, eh, one of the lads has pulled out. We've got a kickboxing show upstairs. Do you want to fight? What do you wear? 
I said, I'm everywhere. Like he went, where, everywhere to pull out. Do you want to fight? And all the lads were sat around. I'd been on that, not a few drinks. They were like, mate, you have to do it. Come on, you have to. I was like, I can't. But I know my ass started going off. Oh, shit. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, fuck it. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I have to rush home. Start swelling my face. Trying to you know, pull myself mm. round. I had a couple of pints and a couple of cheeky ones. I thought, oh my God. I thought, what am I doing here? But I didn't have time to think. It was like, happened in like a three or four hours period where I just thought, oh, fuck it, it's just another tear up, minute. So I ended up going up. I was like, oh, am I fighting like that? He went, ah, don't worry about that. I went, no, no, no. Who am I fighting? What's he had? He went, he's only had a few fights, Benny. You, you'd be all right, you'd be all right. Just, just get in there and just have a fight in it. I thought, right, where is he? His head was about that close to the ceiling. I was like, what? Oh my God, he was about six foot seven. I thought, shit. So anyway, I just got in there. And uh, again, just because because I was I knew I was swinging short and, and, and I had the fundamentals, but I wasn't really taught anything, but I had the fundamentals. I was just stood there. And I was a tough kid. You know, I believe I was born to be become a fighter. It was just it was just in, in my blood. And this kid was battering me, absolutely battering me for the first round, but blew himself, no trying to take me out. Just blew himself, trying to hit me, trying to get me out of there. Second round just come out. Wallop, flattened him. Flattened him, and then everyone was like, "Wow, you've, you've oh, it, was, it was crazy." And then, yeah, that was the journey of me getting into this unlicensed boxing, the white collar boxing, the semi pro boxing, and you know, I had another kickboxing fight. So I started fighting. wasn't training, wasn't training. I was just literally smoking shit load of weed, sniffing a load of coke, going having a tear up, and it was crazy because at the time it was just people who. who, who, who Weren't really boxers, but we're up for it. You know what I mean? And you're getting in the ring and you're fighting. My first white collar boxing lasted three seconds. You know, the bell went ding, boosh, hit him, flattened him. I thought, this is all right, this. Easy. Get, there's a grand fucking sound. Because I was a big ticket seller as well, because I was a big name in the Middlesbrough area. Mm. So we had a lot of people coming to follow us. And then uh, a local kid, a local lad who was doing the boxing shows, um, he says to us, listen, I've got another fight here. Canu, do you want to fight him? This guy was massive massive king can would have called him and i was like he wasn't really a fighter but i'd seen him fighting the boxing he was a big motion i was only a young lad i was about 18 19 i was like yeah sounds i'll fight him the grand even yeah yeah we're like come to fight him so it turns up and it was round about when uh ricky Atten had just been flattened by manny pacquiao and there was a picture in the paper of his head like that you know with sweat flying where his head was just being chinned and i always remember it because when we'd done this fight when i'd done it i beat him flattened him in the first round but I took a f some wallopings, you know, like some proper shots. And my mate, me and my mate were watching a DVD and watch this, bang, and press pause. And my, my head looked like it was just about to come off its shoulders. He dipped me with a big right hand and my head was just like that. And just sweat was flying off me. And he went, look at that. He said, and then it, when, I, when he hit me, I just come back round. I just went, just shook my head like that. And that was it. He just, he just, his head went. You just see him thinking, shit. I just hit him with a left hook and flattened him. And uh, after that, the guy come in the in the in the changing rooms. He says, "Who's Paul Venice here?" I went, "Me." He went, "Where'd you box out of, son?" I went, "My bedroom." He went, "No, I see this. Who, who showed who showed you how to fight like that?" I went, "No." He went, "Nah, behave." I went, "I'm telling you." He went, "Ah, oh, mate." He says, "Come come to Phil Thomas's boxing gym. You need to train. Don't take no more fights. Do not take no more fights. Come to Phil Thomas's boxing gym." I went, "All right, yeah, so you train like you went, yeah, yeah, so I'm a trainer." So I thought, "All right, sounds." So I started training with him. Starts training with him. Just the fundamentals, James. Bump, bump, parry. Step off the centre line. Don't need to get it. You know, just a parry one, two, one, two. Just drilled it for about a week till it becomes like picking your knife and fork up. And then working off combinations. Then I started sparring with lads who were like ABA champions, you know, and like tough kids, tough lads and sparring holding my own. I was actually becoming a bit of a boxer. He said, don't take no more fights. Wait another month. So I was like, all right, but I need some money, Brian. I said, I need to make money. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm too busy fucking shoving everything up my hooter, do you know what I mean? Like anything other money that I earned. I was just too busy sniffing it all or fucking necking it or whatever. So he was like, right, oh, he says, uh, take another fight in three weeks. He says, well, just, get, just keep training that. So anyway, a guy, a guy rang me. Uh, he says, put Bravo on. Remember the old channel Bravo? Yeah. So I banged Bravo on. And there was a big tournament, Britain's Artist Dorman, which is big mush in it. Fucking wiping everyone out. He says, uh, do you want to fight him? And I was like, who was he? His name was Wes Smith. Taught Wes. Big shout out to Wes Smith. He's a good lad. Uh, I'm not sure if he won the tournament, but it was, it was, he must have, because me and him fought for the Britain's, Britain's artist. Dorman, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, I'm 
drugs are still running right for me. I'm still an addict and I'm fucking it, it ruining my life. But I'm training hard every day. I'm boxing every day. I'm still taking steroids every day. So I was like, I'm fucking, I'm going to do it here. I'm a fucking boxer here. They called Wes the Viking Slayer because he beat this fucking, the mountain of a man. Knocked him out when no one had ever beat him. And I was watching all these videos. I was thinking, oh my God, what am I get myself into here? And, uh, and when I got in there with him, you know, he swung a few shots. I was all calm. Oh, move. I was like, whoa, this is different here. You know, I was all calm. I was sharp and poof, hit him. Put him down. Didn't flatten him, just put him down. And I think he just knew he was all wobbly. He couldn't get back up. He just thought, nah, I've had enough. So I won Britain's out of Storming. It was fucking crazy. Mm. I was thinking, what the fuck? And uh, anyway, that was the journey of me, me white collar and, you know, the, 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 the boxing stuff. Because I went to prison about a couple of weeks after that. I ended up going to prison. What was that for? Firearms. For someone to try and shoot you? Well, what happened was, while I'm doing all this, living this life, Sean, I'm, I'm heavily addicted to crack, MCAT, cocaine, Valium. And I mean, when I say addicted, I mean every day, every single day. Even though my appearance looked all right, because I was, I would still get, I'd still find an hour or two to train my ass off and then just deteriorate me insides with, with the pipe or with the line or with the tablets or whatever, smoking shitload of weed. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, a couple of weeks after after that Wes fight, I just went on a fucking rampage. Robbing, stealing, taxing. Just went mental, mental. Obviously, being having the status now of Britain's Hardest Storm, obviously this went to my head now. You know, the uh, the, the Britain's Hardest Storm and the, the big Venner who's never lost a fight, knocking everyone out, it was fucking mental. So I just went out there and just, just expected to take whatever I wanted when I wanted, you know, and it was... You know, more film me, you know, because uh, it just led to some real nasty things happening to me. Uh, you know, get, getting ran over, getting beat up with pickaxe handles, getting jumped. You know, while I'm on a three or four day bender, you know, and because I wasn't killed or wasn't seriously hurt, I just felt un unstoppable. I felt like God, James, you know, like I just felt like I'm still here. Like nothing's ever going to happen to me. They just blasted my house, blast target my family, shot my house up, blasted my house, fucking done whatever they could, you know, to, 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 to get at me. And uh, I ended up arm myself with a Glock 17. It was a replica. It was a replica, but it had been drilled at the bottom. But I couldn't get no ammo. So I just got, had the fucking, had the blanks. It wasn't drilled properly or all like that, but I, they were saying to me, oh, you can buy this, you can do this, and you fucking shoot some. So I'm thinking I'm going to kill someone here with this. Out my tree, been awake for about three or four days. So I'm running around with this fucking Glock 17, Booting doors in, going mental, fucking putting in people's heads and fucking grabbing people. And ah, uh, man, it, the coppers were like half an hour behind me for three days. Step one, step by step. No, ten, our response was turning up. As soon as I'd leave an house, within 20 minutes, they were there. You know, as soon as I'd leave another spot, 20 minutes, they were there. I finally got caught, uh, not far away from me, James. And uh, yeah, sh bang, straight, remanded. I went guilty straight away. I blew, my, I blew the socks off myself. I rang the fucking, I was on the phone in the cop shop. Man, the front of the gun, I'll have prints all, my prints all over it. And fuck, I'm out of it, out of my fucking tree. But a few weeks later, my sister comes see me, says, gives me a piece of paper of the phone call that he had with my missus. He went, you're fucked, mate. I was like, they didn't find no fingerprints, no nothing on the gun either. I don't know how, because I kept wrapping it in a towel and putting it in my waist. Mm -hmm. You know, she was probably, probably wiping it off, do you know what I mean? Did they catch you with it though? Yeah, the, but not on me, it was in a taxi. Because yeah. I, I, I was, I had the taxi driver. He was obviously trying to get rid of me. I'm saying, no, no, you're going to wait there, so I'm going to put a bullet in you. The you know, taxi driver didn't know it was wasn't the route, like it yeah. wasn't going to hurt him unless I hit him with it, <laughs> you know. But it was, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, How was that then? Did you did you feel more added pressure on yourself when you you felt you were untouchable? That obviously people are always going to test you. Nobody's untouchable as you know. Yeah. But did you feel an added pressure on you to try and live up to that reputation? Yeah, um, do you know what, mate? Like looking back at it now, with the person I've become, and 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 the the pedal stool I put myself on, not other people, the pedal stool I put myself on, you know, it was a uh, was a hard life to live. It was a hard life to lead. You know, after the work, because because I you got to remember, James, that stuff that I suffered with as a child never left me. I still didn't like what I seen in the mirror. I was still constantly thinking about death. I, that never left me. You know, that never left me. But I seen it as a weakness. You know, and I thought, people can't find out that I'm like this. You know, I can't, like, I'm upset because I see myself in the mirror. I don't like what I say. I'm not comfortable in my own skin. Fuck that, you're Paul Venice. Britain's Isle's dormant. Get yourself out there. Start fucking cracking heads together. You know, and, 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 I, and I use it as a deflection. So you put your mask on, you stick your chest out, and you go out, don't you? Do you know what I mean? And that's exactly what type of lifestyle I had. You know, and, uh, 
Yeah, it, it took me to some dark places, James, where I was like getting sectioned from drug psychosis. You know, I, I was, you know, I tried to take my life a few times. You know, I remember I was on a four day bender. I'm uh, obviously my last of 21 years, still my rock, my honest, my, the love of my life. She is, you know, I've been with Fair her since school. Yeah, first old sticking out. Yeah, around, I know, you know I, I know. Mean, she's diamond, man. She's yeah. unreal. So, um, but see, she was fucking sick of me. You know, I was like going missing for weeks, James, weeks. And I was tearing up like a fucking head on legs. No, half a man myself, no, wait, not, eat, not eating anything. She would always let me back in. And this one time, she wouldn't let me in. And uh, I had about 40 blueies in my pocket, in volume. Yeah, that's what fucks you up. Yeah, I had about 40 of them in my pocket. So I'd been taking them for these three days, sniffing coke. And I had a, I remember I had an eight ball of whiff in my pocket and a cheap bottle of fucking wine. You said, you mentioned it, what was it called? Bella, Bella Bisco. <laughs> pound, pound bottle of wine. That, it? So I had a bottle of that. And I'm already fucked and I'm trying to get in the house and she was like, nah, fuck off. I'm not coming in. Not where my kids are, not like that. It's in the state of you. You know, she because she always had the kids in mind, you know, and if it wasn't for her, the kids had been gone. You know, she 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 was fucking she's diamond. Anyway, so I fucked off. I thought, I'm I'm done here. I don't want to live this life. She's right. I'm scum. I'm scum of the earth. I'm not a fucking dad. I'm not a husband. I'm I'm fucked. So I just went in the old house, ate the full ate the eight ball, shoved it in my mouth, stared it. I think I get the plastic as well that was in. Shove all the volume in my mouth, just necked them all, just drank this wine and necked them all. I just remember sat there sobbing, crying, thinking this is my time now, do you know what I mean? Like I'm done. You know, and, I, and I just didn't want to be here no more, James, do you know what I mean? Ooh. Bring back a lot of motion. Yeah. It was just like I just didn't. <clears throat> just, just that when I said there and like not being a dad and mm -hmm. you know it's the only regret I have no neglecting my kids and my wife but uh yeah so I took these tablets James and I felt myself drifting off and going crying sobbing and uh I managed to, I woke up I woke up like 16 hours later and I couldn't understand why do you know what I mean like I took enough to fucking kill a an horse <sighs> and uh yeah I was just I was uh I was surprised I woke up anyway, and it uh, goes home. Never, never told the soul, didn't say anything, you know. I wasn't even happy that I was alive, to be fair. I wasn't asked. You know, I was a bit good, if I'm being, if I'm being honest. And uh, I went home, she let me in. My lifestyle just didn't change, James, you know what I mean? I just, again, just going back at it, whatever I'd done, just having a couple of weeks off, thinking I'm all right now, then back at it again. You know, and again... This is where it took me into the prison, you know, leading daft stuff, but getting targeted. People want to hurt me, people want to kill me, you know, and it just, it took me to prison. And uh, I was staring down a decent sentence, which was inevitable at the end of the day, the life I was leading, do you know what I mean, James? So, How hard is that to go to prison knowing that your house has been blasted and then worrying that yeah. could possibly something could happen and you're not there to protect your family? If It, it, it was, I fest, you know, James, when I was in there, uh, I wasn't frightened. I had no fear. I, like, not because I, I just, I looked at it as like a new venture. Ooh, am I going here? Prison. Never been here before. You know, that's how it was. My head was fucked. And that's how it was. And uh, I get into prison. And I remember my door was, I was just, just thinking, like, this is going to be like the films here. Someone's going to want to take my food off me. Someone's going to want to take what I've got. So I remember my flap opening. And they went, all right, mate, have you got out? I went, here. Come here. So I went close to the door and went, who's the boy on here? He went, you, mate. I closed my flap, fucked off. I thought, it's weird. So when the door got open, I saw her. I just ran out, ran on the wing. I was just like, listen, who's the artist on here? And he was like, you, mate? I was, you, you? And I was like, all right. One of my mates was on the on the ones. I went down. I said, but oh, what's cracking here? Like, who's, who's the boy on like? He went, Ben's not like that. So we all just chilled out, man. Just want to do our time, man. He said, just chill, man. Just chill. We're up with sound. Don't worry about it. And I was like, fucking hell, this is easy. And then you're popping into different pads, see who's got what, because I, I, you know, and it was just, yeah, my jail, my jail was quite easy to be fair, but yeah, being locked up on that door, when that door closed, uh, yeah, I shed a few tears, I cried, you know, I'm, I didn't know what was going to happen, realisation was setting in that you, know, you possibly could be in here double figures here, Paul, because that's what they were saying, you know, my solicitors were saying like, look, you're 10, 9, 9 or 10, yeah, yeah. When I'd went down to court, the judge was like, I'll give you fucking 10 years for your reputation alone, Mr. Venice. You know, I was like, oh my God, what's going on here? 
And uh, you know, I went guilty straight away. I went guilty instantly. Um, you know, a couple of couple of months went by, and uh, you know, it didn't get any easier. But I got used to it. You know, I got used to it not being easy. The only thing that wasn't easy, James, is now all the photos were coming, all the letters were coming, the phone calls were happening, the visits were going on. Oh, your son's walking now. You know, your son's just at his first palmo. Mm. I don't know if you know what a palmo is, yeah, chicken yeah, palmo. Yeah. You know, and and, and I always I, I always bring that up. If your son's just at his chicken, his first palmo, and it brought me, it brought me because I just thought, you know, because when I went to jail, my son was like just a baby, and it brought me, James, where I thought, fuck, and uh. Yeah, I, I, I was the type of person that went behind my door and took all the pictures down, so I didn't have to look at them. Ashamed? Yeah. Good. Didn't want to see their faces later, yeah, where I'm at. But when that door opened, poof, back up. And when the lads would come in and go, oh, is that your kids? Well, yeah, that's my kids, that's my wife, that's this, this is. And when that door closed, poof, down. Mm -hmm. Face down, do you know? It's mad to think that big, strong guy, great reputation, Britain's toughest doorman, to then being suicidal, want to take your own life, crying in your cell, mm. but nobody knows what anybody's battling. No. But the amount of people I interview, you know, I, I know that's a weakness. I know that's people being scared because you've yeah. been so broken at such a young age that all that shit then becomes, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm yeah. fine. But the angrier the man, the yeah. weaker the man. And I believe. But when you're going through that then, when you're suicidal, thinking about, I'm, I'm not good enough, thinking about, yeah the bullying for such a young age, like how hard is that for you to grasp and people look at you and think, okay, he's so I want to be him, this is the next Lee Duffy, like, this, yeah. this, I want to be this guy, like you looked up to Lee Duffy and he's probably battled the same exact amount of stuff that you've battled. Yeah. But how did you end up with an Ori him, Lee Duffy? Again, you've just touched on it, he got bullied as a child, you know, he was big head, snotty nose, you know, he was, couldn't breathe through his nose, he, he, you know, I don't want to offend any of his family, but, he, he, you know, he wasn't the cutest kid of the kids, you know. I mean, he was a good-looking man when he got older, you know. He, he, was a, he was a bonny man and he was a good-looking man, but he was just, he was just a target. And when I heard these stories of Lee Duffy being a bully, he was a bully victim, he was picked on bad, he was this, he was that, you know. And I just thought, yeah, I've gone through that. I've gone through that. And then when he got to, like, when he got, he went to prison and when he got out, he was jogging, like, from town to town, dormant to dormant, artist to artist, in shorts and vests, you know, I just, I thought, fuck, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to have the balls to do that. You know, I want to show people that this is what happens when you bully youngins. This is what we turn into. You know, and I just thought, fuck it. And and, and that's how I'd become in awe of him. You know, and you got to remember, like, I'm born in the same, I'm like, practically on the same street, same town, you know, the same people. I was sitting around, when he passed away, like, I was around all these people who knew him just telling story after story after story. And I'm a kid sat there listening, going through the same shit he was going through when he was a kid, you know? And I'm just thinking, yeah, I'm going to be like him. I'm definitely going to be like him one day, you know? And uh, I just become obsessed with him, I'm obsessed with listening to stories. And you've got to remember as well, everyone, everyone who's over the age of 50 has a story about Lee Duffy, you know, good or bad. They all have a story about him. You know? How tough was he though for twenty six? How did you have a fearsome reputation at twenty six? When kind of you're still not even. He was the peak? Lenny McLean of the northeast. Lenny McLean's reputation down south. You know it. It. It's. You know it. You know what it is. The yeah. films and all that. That's what he was. The northeast. It's just. It's just the northeast a bit smaller, isn't it? But he was hard, unbeatable. What kind of stuff did he do? Just go to Newcastle and just start wiping Domino for fun, just because. Just because there was so. I, he, so my lass is dad. John Burley, big shout out to John Burley. Uh, he was good pals with Lee Duffy. He was his driver. He would drive Lee, and he took he took Lee to Newcastle because Lee had true with Viv Grimm, and he was wanting to fight Viv. So Lee pulled up outside a nightclub, short and vest, short and vest, walked towards the dorm, boom, flattened four of them, flattened all four of them just out. You know, in them days, mate, the dorm went for any spring chickens with her. Do you know what I mean? They were obviously tough twats. Walk straight in the nightclub, grabs the mic off the DJ, give Viv Graham down here now, tell him the duff is here. Boosh, on the next one. Boosh, flattening everyone. You know, I remember getting told that story. I got told one story, right? Uh, this had never left me, and I just come, when I heard it, it was me, me my dad's brother Brian. He was, uh, he said, he was, he was only a kid when Lee was like sort of up and coming. He was in his pram. 
He said, Paul, he said, I was outside Barney Bills. He says, and uh, I just see Lee pull up going. He says, and I'm just sat there like that. He said, about 20 minutes later, van pulled. Loads of lads got out, walked into the pub, started shouting, where's he, where's he? So they all come back out and Lee walked out on his own. He said, it was like somewhere of a film, like a, like a wild west film. They went just, boom, boom, just flattening them, just flattening them all one by one. You know, just, just lay them all out and then just walk back in the pub, kind of drinking. I was like, shut up, man. He went, honestly, Paul, he said, it was mad. He even knocked one out with a body shot. He said, passed out, hit him with a body bloke, just flattened him. I was like, wow. Even I'm at this stage now thinking, oh, these can't be like, no, you know, everything, yeah, everything, gets, everything gets exaggerated. Yeah. But like talking to like my old man who done the doors, he said, Paul, he said, listen, there'll never be another man like him. Never. You know, he was getting shot at. He had his do foot blew off. He was, and he would still stand in the middle of the town with his back to the, back to the road, just doing all the doors on his own. Shorts and vest. Just do all the doors and put on his own. Just walk from door to door. No, all nightclubs and that. Do them all on his own. 26, man. Only a young boy, man. Only a kid. Can't remember as well when he was at 26. He was ravaged. Same with same stuff that I've told you about the drugs and that. He was on a downward, downward spiral when he was like 24, 25, 26. From what I've heard, you know. Mm -hmm. And who killed him? His best friend? Wasn't his best friend, was it? It was, uh, they were, Allo was a tough man as well. Was like, he slashed him in the back or something? The, I don't really know the full ins and outs, but he was stabbed in the back, yeah. He was stabbed, I think he was stabbed, in, no, he was stabbed in the armpit. He was stabbed in the armpit. That was him going 26. Yeah. You know what, as well, so, so if someone had a, applied pressure, the ambulance was there within 20 minutes. Someone had just went over and applied pressure, he'd mm -hmm. still be alive now. Do you think because it was him, though, that nobody no one to go next to him? Because he was jumping all, uh, jumping all over, going off it. I think he ran as well, you know. You got to remember as well, like as, as much as I'm telling you, like he's a, he was a, he was like a fucking god. Still, a lot of people didn't like him. Do you know what I mean? So maybe there was a people there for. Well, don't help him. Let him die. Mm. But did they not used to play Russian roulette and that and hold yeah. a gun and fucking shoot each other? He done it. He done it. Oh, last that. Come in. <laughs> went into South Bank. Bullish that Stadium. is psychotic. South shit. Bank Bullish Stadium with a gun, okay. and he went pointed at our last dad's head. Our oh, last dad, fucking ruthless. He's off his head. I I, I think I went to his. I went to our last dad's with a gun, put it at his head, and he went, he didn't know, it was, he thought, like, he, he thought it was real, and he was just like, go on then, go on then, I said, you're going to have me shot, weren't you? Put it at his head, he was like, drinking his drink, go on then, he's fucking off it, honestly, he's mental, and I, I just went, ah, I'm only joking, and I left. Why did you do that? I don't know. Mad with that? Yeah, he was, he, do you know me and John have had a, a, a very strange relationship? Obviously, I'm with his, his baby girl, Anna, do you know what I mean? I'm a bad man. Well, I was a bad lad, do you know what I mean? And you try to you put a gun to his head? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, that's fucking sick, mate. I put it to his head and then I put it with his knee and he was just sat there cool as fuck. Just going, go How on. old were you? I think it was about 20, 19, 20, something. Fucking hell, man. He was just like, oh, man. My daughter's only 12, man. I no wee prick better do that, mate, in 10 years. Time, mate. <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. I'm, I'm making the same <laughs> thing. Fuck hell. <laughs> oh, mate. But, uh, mate, it, it, I think, you know, it was, it was just the life I was leading, do you know what I mean? It was just, it was just fucking mental. And then, um, he, he just, he, he'd seen it all, done being there and done it and got the t shirt, do you know what I mean? He didn't bat an it. He just sat there looking at me going, do it. I am bothered. So he was like, he was fucking off it. Did you give him more respect for that? Yeah, I, I loved him then anyway. Hmm. I loved him then anyway. We had a for strange our relationship. But, uh, you no, know, we would always butter heads and batter heads and stuff like that and argue. But he knows I respected him and he respected me, do you know what I mean? He always respected me because I never laid a finger on his daughter. Even though I was a twat. I was horrible. Never laid a finger on her. Never would, never have. You know yeah. what I mean? And he respected me for that, you know. Did you ever... Obviously, we can speak about it now and everything's out and open, but did you ever speak to anybody yourself about how you were feeling mentally, ever? Not the time, no. But, uh, you know, nothing crazy happened for me in, in, in prison, James, nothing. It was just I just it was just it a breeze through it. But when I got out, I just couldn't go back to that lifestyle. Why? I knew what I was like. I knew what I was. I didn't want to die. You know, I'm, For the first time? Yeah, I didn't want to die. I wanted to be a dad. I wanted to be there for my wife. I know my missus deserved like me, she deserved me, you know, to, to be a good man, she deserved a good man, you know, and, um, but also, I needed it for me, you know, I, I didn't like what I'd become, you know, I didn't want to kill myself, I didn't want to die, for, I just, I wanted to be there for my kids and for my missus, and uh, when I got out, my mum, uh, amazing woman, you know, and my dad is the, the amazing parents now, my dad's a Christian, and 
my mum was banging the fellowship and I got anonymous. You know, a funny old story about this recovery, James, because um, my granddad, Glaswegian, I think he is, broad Scottish, says to you earlier on the cameras, don't know where he says, but he's, he's a mint, or he's a mint man. Um, he brought, he done, he done a big prison sentence fucking 40 odd years ago and he got, he, he got involved with A, Alcohol Anonymous. So what he done was, when he got out of prison and, and when he was involved in it, he seen that his three daughters were addicts. My mum, my auntie Linda, my auntie Annette. The three of them were addicts, so he brought this fellowship to Middlesbrough, Nycox Anonymous, for his three daughters, so they could be saved through fellowship. Uh, sadly, my auntie Annette died through heroin overdose. Um, and uh, my mum and her little sister Linda, they're 20, 20 odd years clean and sober. Amazing. Yeah. So they carried the message to me when I got out of prison. I said, you know you're an addict, son. Like, what do you want to do? Like, there's a life here you can have without using, without active addiction. Come. So I thought, oh, yeah, I will, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I got into it, James, you know, and it, and it, it wasn't easy. <clears throat> I'll tell you now, I was going for like eight years and I kept relapsing. Now, like, I'd get like four months clean, relapse. Five months clean, relapse. And that was a story of my life for about seven, eight years. And, uh, but this time around, when I've got out of prison and and, and, and I fucking want it bad, I got into it big time. You know, I've been out of prison now nine years and um, seven and a half years clean and sober I've had, do you know what I mean? Which is an yeah. amazing achievement. And uh, I live by it. Like, don't get me wrong, I've struggled. It's not all the better roses for me. But it just gave me a, like I was always promised, you know, if you get into this, you can have a life beyond your wildest dreams. And when that guy told me this, I thought he was going to give me a lot of money or buy me a car or, or do something nice for me. That's what I thought. I thought, fucking hell, what do you mean by that? So I'm going home thinking, he's going to look after me. And little did I know, he just meant just give this 100% and you'll have a life beyond your wildest dreams. I thought, all right, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm going? Well, this guy's my sponsor now. Mm -hmm. He sponsors me, this guy, you know, and he, and he guides me through, through, through fellowship, through Nycox Anonymous. And he wasn't wrong. You know, I, I fell into a mixed martial arts gym, a kickboxing gym. You know, within six months, I turned pro. You know, within a year, I was in top 10 British, I was in the British rankings in top 10. You know, the second year, I was winning British titles, English titles, Northern titles. You know, I was undefeated. I was fighting, earning decent money. I was free from drugs. I had God. You know, I'd become a Christian. You know, all this, all this stuff was happening. I was thinking, fuck, it's all because of fellowship, this. You know, and I wasn't thinking, I wasn't even thinking about using. You know, I was a good dad. You know, I was loyal to my woman. You know, I was a good man. I'd give her the things, we'd go on all over, we could do anything we wanted, you know what I mean? And, and not only that, she got the full attention. And I'd become the man I knew I always was. You know, uh, I never changed. Things were just stripped away. You know, it's, it's like the, the onion effect in it. These, everything's stripped away and then you're just left with you. And that's all that happened. You know, deep down, I always hated who I was. You know, I was never that person that, reputation, ego fueled, fucking idiot, maniac, I want to be the artist, it's just an illusion. It was just a fantasy world. You know, and uh, I got banged into fellowship and then uh, and I never looked back. Don't get me wrong, it's 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 not easy, but it's easier than being out there living in that life where you you're just doing everything else to fix yourself. You know, your drugs, your gambling, you, everything else around you that tries to fix you is that's just bad for you. I finally found something that was fixing me, that was filling that hole for the better. You know, it was making me into a, I, I was, I was be, I, a lot of better person, a miles better person, do you know what I mean? And I, I loved it, I loved it. Started working the steps, got myself a sponsor, started carrying the message, you know, and um, I found God. I become a Christian, I got myself baptized. And all I, I was doing all this outside of, and I was fighting as well. Just, just taking over this, this, this K1 scene. You know, on the British level, by the way, you know, I've been getting a bit of stick for labelling myself as a K1 world champion. Even though I didn't win a world, world title, but it was just the ICO Mickey Mouse one. But were you 31 fights, 30 kills? 32 fights, 31 knockouts. Yeah. And so, that's K1? It was all in all. Everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah. But I think I'd had about 27 K1 fights, mm -hmm. professional fights. And uh, see, I got a bit of stick for when our pal Danny Christie posted some world title. People were like, no, he's not. Because you have your glory K1, which is well renowned, you know, and that was always my 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 dream to fight on there against them guys. Right, didn't you? you know, 
license, firearms. They were in like Australia, you know, America. And I just couldn't, because when when, they did, they emailed me, Glory K1. They emailed me, uh, we're keeping an eye on Venice, we're watching his, his progress and he's, we, we want to see what he's doing. I was the only undefeated heavyweight K1 fighter in the top five. I was the only undefeated one. You know, you had your likes of Daniel Sam, Arnold Orbitov, they all been beat, they all drew, and they were fighting on Glory K1 and stuff like that, well, well fight series, all these men shows. I just couldn't get a break. You Google my name and it comes up, fucking firearms and this, that, the other. So there was a bad stigma around us. I just couldn't get a break. But I was f willing to fight anyone, anytime, anywhere. Do you know what I mean? Like I'd actually become a proper fighter. I wasn't just one of these on the streets where I thought was I looking in the mirror, taking stories and thinking, I'm out as fuck here. You know, I was literally fighting, you know, and I was I was training my ass off. I had good sponsors. You know, I had decent people backing me, you know, and... What the fight that put me on the map was a guy called Cal Hewitt. He was about, you know, he had been beat once or twice, but he was a fucking giant. Six foot seven, six foot eight, kicked like a horse. No one wanted to fight him. You know, it was early days for me, but I was fit. It was a WSK, um, WSK British title. And they were heavily involved in the rankings on the British level. And this was the British title. And uh, his fighter had pulled out two weeks' notice and says, Look, Paul, do you want, do you want this fight? I said, yeah, what can I do? We'll go fight. Let's have it. And, uh, you know, massive respect for Cal Hewitt. He was, I still speak to him now. He's, you know, he was a, he was a mountain of a man. Like, like literally, I felt like Rocky versus Dolph Lundgren. That's how I felt. You know, and muscles bulging everywhere. But he was a lovely guy. You know, we had nothing but mutual respect on the fight. And I managed to, to, to beat him convincingly, like, like in, a, in an excellent fashion. Like where I, where I knocked him out in the second round. And it looked fucking fantastic, by the way. Sorry, Cal, mate, but it needs to be said. And I, I knocked him out in a, in a, in a, great, a great fashion, do you know what I mean? And I just thought, wow. And that was it. Sponsors come flying in. You know, people were coming up and, you know, it just took off. And I was literally doing it for a living. I was fighting for a living. You know, and I, it was like a dream come true. Free from drugs. Got God in my life. Family's mint. I'm, I'm living the dream, man. I'm doing something that I love doing, do you know what I mean? And I was good at it good at it you know what i mean but when i was gone into the top four you've got your likes of your icos your wsk you know like your european titles and your world titles which they're still only british level to be fair but you are fighting from people all around the continents you know like your elman zibages you know i fought all these guys you know like lad from bosnia's and you know i i, I, I battled actually i never fought elman zibage he pulled he pulled out but i thought i was fighting decent lads now do you know what i mean and uh yeah, so I won this European title, the ICO European title. I won the ICO World title. Now I'm fl I'm number three in the rankings now, do you know what I mean? Glory message. Oof, we're interested. What's the crack? What's the day? What's he got planned? When when I come in the gym and chap he told me, I was like, wow, fucking Jordan. He's like, nah. I said, you should sign a contract with Glory, mate. You've made it. Yeah, you you find them, you 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 signing a four or five contract. You made for life. You know, you only need to fight once for him, you're done. So I was like, Phew. And I wouldn't even bother doing the put in front of me. I'm not saying I would would have been able to to win on that level, but I'd have fucking give it a go, James. You know what I mean? Not a problem. Like 100. percent I'd have, it's do or die for me. Simple, you know. And uh, I was just over the moon. Anyway, a couple of months went by. I I'd had a couple more fights. I went to Scotland and fought a kid called Alan Drain uh, in Motherwell. That was mental. <laughs> <laughs> that was mental. So uh, I took down short notes just to keep active. I took down short notice, actually struggled with the big madhead. He was he was strong like. But I, I, again, stopped him, stopped him in the second round. Uh taking a little fight just to try to keep busy, you know, but nothing was really like the, the fights that you see on YouTube, they're they're like kind of the big deal ones. But no one's seen all these little fights that I was having, no Western Superman. I was traveling down there fighting and they were fighting some lunatic for a for a like a little English title that looked like a Ben Sherman belt to read, really. Mm -hmm. It was just a crappy little belt, but it was still a fight for me. And the guy was a tough bastard again. Do you know what I mean? It was these fights that were that were really fucking uh, giving me good experience. And um, anyway, when I come back to the gym one day, and I just we had an email saying, oh, we've been looking at Venice's record. It's brilliant. What's the crack with his criminal record, the firearms and this, that, the other, and his prison sentence. I'm still on license, James. No, I was still had license, still had a year's license, you know, and they just fucking blew us out. 
it was absolutely shut me down, blew us out. And I just lost, I just, I was so disheartened. It was unbelievable. Do you know what? I just thought, mm, I'm done. You're thinking about relapsing? Yeah. Yeah. Again, low self-worth setting. Started feeling sorry for myself. All them old emotions and old feelings come setting in. I thought, oh, shit, what am I going to do now? Do you know what I mean? I thought I was going to become a millionaire from this fighting. Where really I was just living comfortable. You know, I was living comfortable. It was decent wages I was getting. It was nice wages. I was doing three or four grand in sponsorship deals a month. You know, getting all food paid for, mm -hmm. travel, all, everything. You know, and uh, it was a good lifestyle for me. But I wanted to become a millionaire from a James. Do you know what I mean? Like in my head, I'm thinking, I'm fighting on that glory and I'm going to be mixing it with them. My heroes, you know, the legends. And when it, when it got shot down, it brought me. I just thought, that's it, I'm done. I'm done. I just walked away. I never actually went, I'm retired. Just done. I How long ago was that? That was about five years ago. Do you regret that? I do now. Now I'm training and now I'm getting getting fit. And How old are you now? I'm 36. Are you going to have another fight? And that? What, so what's the rules for K1? Motai, but it's scored exactly. Motai scored different. You know the music in the background? Yeah. Don't quote me on this because someone will comment and say I'm wrong or whatever. But I think you got the music gets faster and faster, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. so you have to keep that pace. You know, you have to swing so many kicks per round and, you know, it's how you take them and, you know, it's, it's scored different. Mm -hmm. Where K1 is scored exactly how boxing is. If you're bossing that fight, whether you're using your hands, your legs, your knees, your elbows, it doesn't matter what you're using. If you're bossing that fight, you're bossing the fight. Simple. If you're pushing the pace, you're winning the fight. Mm -hmm. That's it. You're winning the fight. It's just exa scored exactly the same as boxing. Apart from leg kicks, head kicks, knees, elbows, brutal. I loved it. Loved yeah. it. Yeah. How was it the first year trying to change your life when you're active and doing bad shit and people try to kill you and stuff as well? Like, how hard is it? Because no matter if you want to change your life the first year or two, yeah. the people who's your enemies don't see that anyway. Nah. They just see weakness then. Yeah. So how do you deal with that if people start putting it on you? Well, funny enough, I was kind of left alone. Mm -hmm. No, I th I, 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 when I got out. I didn't bother no one. Do you think people were relieved then that you weren't fucking being a pest? Well, I got out at 19 stone. Mm -hmm. No drugs in me. Training. You know, I was already, you know, I don't think anyone wanted to meet me in a in an alley or head on at that time because, you know, I was healthy. I was big. I wasn't this vulnerable person who was on crack and whatever. You know, I just don't think, I just let, I, I just come out and just people left me alone. Like I wasn't, you know, it, 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 I just, no one bothered me you know I was perfectly fine doing my own thing trying to change trying to live differently it was hard you know I, I, like I said James I relapsed you know I, some, I found myself once or twice going on a bender and you know yeah it was hard and plus we were fucking skinned you know I was at food bank James I was going to food bank you know because we were signing, scratching on you know because I didn't want to go out and earn money the way I used to or do whatever I did to get money you know robbing tax and doing whatever I had to do I didn't want to do that no more so I was like, right, what do I need to do, Sammy? This is my wife. I need to go to the door. You've got a meeting. Fuck that, I'm not going there. Well, that's okay. See, when you get stopped. Oh, there's no food in. Because we got none. So I'm having to go to the fucking local church, the food bank to get money, you know, to get food. You know, they give you a fucking... It was just an hard, it was an hard time, but it was, it was humbling. It was a humbling experience because at the end of the day, I didn't want to go back to that life. I couldn't do what I... I, I didn't want to become what I'd become, do you know what I mean? Like I, did, I couldn't go back to that. So I just thought, do you know what? Try to get jobs and I was doing, you know, I'd actually become employable, you know, because I'd changed, I'd put drugs down and I was working at a fellowship, I'd become employable. I got a job at Tesco Warehouse, James, you know what I mean, in the first year. Well, £7.50, £8 an hour. You know, I, I was heavily involved in fellowship and this time as well, I was training, like I was training like a mad dog in this, in this kickboxing MMA gym, Impact Martial Arts it was called. I was training in this gym and I was working six till two, two till 10. Do you know what I mean? It was humbling for me, you know, because I was actually putting the fucking work into change. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I didn't want to be that person no more. So getting the job, it had to be done, you know, trained. If I wanted to become a fighter, I had to train, you know, and that's what I've done, I trained. Yeah. You know, and- uh, How hard is it on your mum? If she's in the fellowship, seeing her son just being a loose cannon and fucking up left, right and center. Can only imagine. I can only imagine. Did she ever reach out to you and say, look, you're fucking up? 
I was it's, I'll, it's hard. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Jim, I'm going to share something with you know, which I never ever, I've never said. You know, and I don't look at my mum thinking that she's a bad person. She saved me when, when she done this. She was the one, one who rang the police on me and told me I had a gun for my own safety. You know, you know she doesn't mind me saying that. You know, she, I'm sure she won't. But she was the one who rang the police on me because she knew I was either going to kill someone or get shot. You know, so she rang him on me. She was the one who says, look, he's got a gun, he's going to do this, he's going to do that. You know, they didn't know it was just a replica at the time. You know, so, yeah, big props to her, man. Yeah, you know, man. she she would turn up. you got to remember, James, my mum was brought up in a Scottish family. She was yeah, a rough she girl. Was bigger she bigger psycho than you. Mate, I've, <laughs> I've seen her come in sessions and start just walloping people, whoosh, whoosh, knuckling women and lasses and chinning people. And Oh, she was roughing. I've never seen my dad have a fight. He was a lovely man. He was a doorman, massive. Yeah, didn't really need to have a fight. He was too nice. People respected him. He was a big man. He was a good man. See my mum have loads. See my mum have loads. And then it's not that tight where women pull hair. Someone grabbed their hair. She's... Yeah. Oh, yeah. My oh, dad yeah. was the same. He was a doorman in Glasgow. But my, it's my mum. It's the fucking crack pot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, now, to me, uh, James, you, or to me, even one of my parents, you would never think. Mm -hmm. Because... Fucking outstanding people. The thing about change, it's a great thing. We, it's a beautiful thing when you start changing, but it's also a more beautiful thing when your mum says that they're proud of you. Yeah. That fucking gets you going. You think, fuck. But, yeah. And then you, you reminisce about the past and you think, okay, I was a, a loose cannon. Like, yeah. But when you get that, I'm proud of you. That That's that's no money, no matter how yeah. many fights you win. That there is a gold where it makes you feel proud and it makes you keep going. I seen that on my mum's face when I picked the white chip up, which is... A year. A new, no, the white chip up is just wishing for a new way of life. Mm -hmm. Not even clean. Mm -hmm. Just picking it up. If there's only one here in the first meeting that wishes for a new way of life, me. There you go. My mum. Well done, son. Well done. You know, amazing woman. Because that's what she wanted for me. A new way of life. You know, and then before you know it, I'm picking a 90 day chip up. She's there. Well done. Picking the air chip up. Well done. You know, I always knew. My mum's always loved me. Always. You know, my little sister, I beg to differ, but I'm, a th I'm the favourite. Like she's my, you know, she's a daddy's girl, my little sister. My little sister, again, she's 12 years clean and sober. You know, she's in recovery. It's a family thing, man. You know, she's, my little sister's like my big sister in recovery. You know, she's well ahead of me. You know, she's fucking out, outstanding woman. My, my, my little sister, she's uh, six years younger than me. So she's 30. Yeah, she's out cracking young girl, do you know what I mean? Flying because of recovery, you know, but... Uh, my mum always had a little thing for me where, because cause I needed more muddy cuddling, more looking after because of my days of going out and I would literally be 18, 19 after four or five day bender crying. She's growled me, cuddling me like my baby. And I'm sobbing, sobbing. I want to die, I don't want to be here. She's crying me, yeah? No one, no, knowing exactly what I'm going through because she's been there herself. Knowing what I'm saying is true. That's coming out of my mouth, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And she's just looking at her son was riddled with a, this disease of addiction. Were you in recovery when your sister was an addict? Uh, no. Uh, you the last one to get in recovery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, my sister's 12 years now. You know, she's way ahead of me. You're coming up for eight. Yeah. Fair play, but that just shows you the strength of the, the family then. Yeah. To, to dig deep and make the changes. There's not many people get out. Yeah. Same as myself, man. Relapse, relapse, relapse. Two years, felt amazing. I can have a drink. Fucked it for a year, full year. Yeah. went missing and every day I still think about dabbling because it's self-sabotage rip the whole ceiling down because you don't deserve yeah. it James you've came too far just do what you're good at do it take a line have a bit it's every fucking day there's a voice here I always remember her and it never left me and I thought that will never leave me when it got said to me so I was always giving myself and I was clean I was always giving myself another time of thinking why do I still want to use why do I still want to be a horrible bastard why is my head still telling me Go do this, go do that. No, and it's nothing, nothing's ever nice going through my head. And he went, you're not, you're thinking, Paul. Always remember that. And I thought, right. He went, always remember, Paul. Your head wants you dead. And I thought, fucking hell, that's heavy. But the more I thought about it, I thought, yeah, it definitely does. You know, and years on down the line, load of recovery, sponsors, living good, having a good life. My head still wants me dead on a daily. I put it to rest in the morning. What do you do? Pray, meditate. No, speak, reach out, speak to the fellow addicts, speak to my sponsor, you know, do a bit of step work. No, 
watch a share on YouTube. Takes takes what, all of 10, 15 minutes on the morning to put it to a put put it to rest. You know, like just literally just pray. Paul's will will get me nowhere. God's will. Just your will today, please. You know, and I find myself praying for other people, praying for my friends, family, or whoever, do you know what I mean? And then asking for God to take away my will and let me live on his. You know, and, and it, it just, it just, it's all, something changes, my mindset changes. You know, I think, I've put the work in. You know, there's the effort, there's the time there. You know, I don't want to be running with this. I need it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my thought, my change, the, the way I think changes. You know, I want to go, you want a cup of tea, babe? You know, I want to go, kids, breakfast done. If I don't do that work on the morning, Kids will go, Dad, what have you done me for breakfast? Do your fucking own. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Sammy, do you, like my missus, do we put the kettle on down? Light though. You know, and that's mm -hmm. that's where my head will take me. You know, if I don't do that work on the morning. What's a daily routine like after that when you get up? Exercise, eat clean? Mm, you know what? It, it can vary because when I put that effort in, you know, I can have the time to go, right, what do you want to do? You know, what, are you, is everything okay if I go do this? You know, can I do this? Can I do this? You know, and I, and I sort of have the humbleness around me to go, right, let's work some out. What, because my missus is so busy. You know, she looks after us all. You know, she, she, she proper looks after us all. And, you know, so I, I try my best to go, like, am I okay doing this? Because I can make myself so busy. PTs, training kids, training people, you know. Then she knows how my head is where I'll go, I want to fight. I want to go do this. I need to go meet him. I need to go see this. You know, and then the YouTube stuff I've got going on now. You know, she's like, uh, do you mind if you spend a bit of time with me today? And I'm like, yeah, all right. Where, you know, she sees how busy I am. And I need have to have the ability to go, yeah, of course I can. You know, she'll tell you that. You're full of shit, I mean, you never want to spend time with me. <laughs> how did the, the Lee Duffy film come about where you played these character? So I was, it was mad. It was about, about a year and a half ago. And uh, I was just sat there. And her phone was ringing. I thought, who's that? So I was like, it was locked down. We're in lockdown. So I answered it. Hello. She says, oh, this is Paul Venice. says, yeah. She says, uh, when you play Lee Duffy in a film, I went, pop. Boom, just put the phone down. I last went, who's that? I went, no, you don't want to know. She said, no, was it? Because my, my fights are all over YouTube. You know, I, I hadn't had Instagram or, or, or Facebook or anything like that for long. You know, a couple of years. and But it was blown up, you know, like people were, you know, I, I mean, there was getting a couple of thousand followers and there were people who wanted that. Oh, there was loads of mad stuff going on. And uh, I thought, it's bullshit. And then I got a message saying, no, no, serious, you need to speak to me. My name's Steve Rafe. You know, I think it was Steve Rafe. Yeah, Steve Rafe, you need, you need to speak to me. So I was like, okay. I rang him, I went, what's going on here? He went, yeah, Paul, we, we've like, you're from South Bank? I went, yeah. You know Lee Duffy? I went, yeah, of course I do. He says, uh, you're from the same town? I says, I'm on the same street. Where he, where he was born. They were like, all oh, right, uh, would you play him in a film? I went, I'm not an actor, mate. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Can we meet you? I went, yeah, when? Um, like, just after Christmas. I said, we'll get Christmas out of the way, we'll come meet you. I went, all right, sound. I said, is this you on these videos on YouTube? I went, yeah. I mean, you still look like that? I went, no. I said, I don't like lockdown, I'm full of looking palmos and, <laughs> and beef burgers and that. You know, I was I was like 20 clem in this fight. And when I was fighting, I was like 16, 17 stone, not ripped and thin and that. She was like, so do you not look like this on YouTube? I went, no. He went, how do you look? I went, I'm 20 stone. He went, you joking? And I went, no. Nah. I said, even fat? I went, well, nah, because I built my own gym. So I said, nah, I said, I'm powerlifting, like, I said, I'm big. I said, but I don't look like that. I said, look, look, look. I look more like a like a Russian fucking powerlifting or like the shop putters. Mm -hmm. I was a bit like one of them. He started laughing and he was like, oh God. He said, can you get back down to that? I went, yeah, of course I can. If, you, if you're being serious, yeah. I'll just treat it like a fight and I'll just strip down. She so went, try and strip down now and before you meet us. I went, all right. So I, I lost a bit of weight. I calmed down on the weights. You know, I, I stripped down to about 18 stone. And then uh, I went and met him. And uh, Stephen Sayers and all these people were there and the, like all these big names. And I was like, fucking hell. Uh, Jamie Boyle, big shout out to Jamie Boyle. Jamie Boyle. Yeah, big, Jamie Boyle was there. First time I'd met him. And, you know, I instantly loved Jamie. I thought he was a good man. Um, and they were all just like, wow. Like, no way. And then when I started talking, like, all right, lads, all right, I was going, I was going. They're like, fuck, no way. It's like, because I'm Steve and they're like, we're close with him. They're like, why, you sound just like him? I'm like, we, I, man, you sound just like him. They're like a proper Jordan. I was like, wow. They're like, I can't believe it. They're like, you're perfect, perfect. And I was like, really? They're like, yeah, yeah, perfect. So I was like, oh, mint. So 
yeah, the, the rest was history. Got the got the part and started going down there, doing a bit of acting and all that. It was strange. Was How weird. was that? No acting experience. You know, getting was, thrown into the deep I, well, I says, I says to the, to the to the guys who were doing the film. I says, listen, I'm not an actor here. So I'm not an actor. They went, listen, we don't want you to be an actor. We, we like from what we've heard, you similar lifestyle, similar story. Went, yeah. So he took me out. He says, you're going in there. You're going to like. There's a guy going to be talking about Viv Graham. Like there was a scene where the guy's talking about Viv Graham, and uh, you can overhear it. And you, you, you like it offends you hearing his name, so you're fuming. You grab him and that. So I'm like, this guy's an actor. So, I'm like, all right, all right. so what he's going to just look at what would Paul Venice do? Just put yourself in that situation. I thought, right, all right. So I ended up grabbing him, slapping him, get him here now, get him down here now. I'll punch his fucking head and he'll do this, do that. And all about. For a while, I kept like slapping him and going, oh. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I kept slapping him and tapping him. He was going, but you can see he was like, oh. Uh, no, he just wanted to get the last slap done and that was it. And uh, he was brilliant after this guy. Like, And then he went, listen, just let go. After about three or four takes, I was sound. I just sort of went in the moment of like, if as if it was real, where I'd be like, you know what I mean? You just put yourself there, like as if it's as if you've been in a similar situation, do you know what I mean? And that was it, yeah. Then they loved it. He was like, class, raw. I said, shall I do some acting classes? He went, no, don't do that. So they take away all the, the rawness from you. We don't want you to be an actor. He went, watch, I'll show you. So he sent an actor out and they wanted to play the same scene as I've done there. And then he went, watch. When they're done it, you could see it was, it was, act, it was, it was acted, acting. yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, well, yours, it's real, Paul, it's raw. You can see, do you know what I mean? I thought, fucking sound. How did you handle the lockdown? I was sound. I was sound. No, no. I don't need to keep busy out and about, just fucking. I'd spent more time with the kids, more time with my missus mm -hmm. than I ever have. You know, I had my own gym on my back, but a big outhouse, big gym. I had all the weights you could think of, hack squats, squat machines, over 400 kilos loads of weather plates. I had a running machine and everything, everything. I was, mate, I've got another lockdown now. I was comfortable <laughs> with me. I wasn't asked. I wasn't asked because I just thought, no, sometimes I'm, I can be, you know, I've worked hard to be comfortable in my own bubble. I've worked hard and been comfortable and been bored. When I got bored years ago, James, especially when, when I, I'd give me a feet. I'd want to go out and start terrorising someone or getting off my tits or doing something fucking mad where I welcome it now. You know, I do, I do enjoy being bored. You know, probably because I'm getting older, but I love being bored. You know, I'm very comfortable in it. You know, when there's nothing to do, you sat there, Netflix, flicking. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. See, when you talk about the stuff that you've done, do you ever feel ashamed? I did a fest. I had a lot of guilt and shame where... Um, I didn't sleep, you know. I couldn't forgive myself for some of the stuff that I'd done. Um, yeah, it, 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 it messed with my head a lot. Sometimes still can. It can creep up. It can creep up. But I have the ability to work hard to forgive myself, you know, and that's all down to the grace of God, you know. Um, I have the ability to pray and ask him for forgiveness, and I know I'm forgived for what I was. And then plus, like, these are the people who were in this recovery, in this fellowship, and you speak to them and that, they're so wise. You know, our predecessors have worked this, worked this fellowship for you for, for over multiple years, and you speak to him and you say, "Look, I'm having a hard time. Like when I've done this or this and this," and he goes, "Just always remember, Paul, it wasn't you. You're not accountable. You know, you're not accountable for that. You know, it was the disease of addiction that drove you to doing that. You know, that you're not that person no more, Paul. Don't hold yourself accountable for it. You know, and I thought, right. And I just when I heard those words, I thought, yeah, do you know what? Like I wouldn't do that today. You know, I would." I just couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to doing that. You know, I have a conscience now. I do feel sorry for people. You know, I've got it's just it's just a strange one because I know it can creep in sometimes where I can have a nightmare, like a using dream. I can have these using dreams where you're fucking horrible, man. Where you wake up and you're yeah, like you're yeah. off your tits and you wake up and you think shit, shit. Yeah. But then I you know what brings me around. My wife's laid there. Mm -hmm. As long as I know I'm in bed with her, because this is a place I wouldn't be. She would I'd probably be on the doorstep. Do you know what I mean? When I see her there, I'm like. I, but I love it. I don't love them because they're very vivid and they're, you know they're, they're extreme. But I, I, I get grateful. I get filled with gratitude at the fact that that was a dream. That's not me out there doing that. Mm -hmm. It's a dream, you know. And uh, but I some nights I can be awake and think, as if you've done that, Paul. You know, as if you went and done that. You know, and, and it can fill me with with remorse, guilt, shame for the people I had. 
But yeah, I, I can forgive myself for the stuff that I've done. Have you ever done counselling? No. Therapy? No. Yeah, near by, but I've, I've been speaking about it a lot, man. I think I'm going to give it a bash this year. Yeah. It's just that, I, it's the trust thing. Like, I, I'm scared that you tell them something and they're sitting at a party at the weekend fucking tell them what you've told them. I know they won't, but part yeah. of me is maybe that's, that's my ex excuse for not to go. Yeah. But as much as we try and face it all in these podcasts are therapy for me just talking shit man and, and getting yeah. everything out there but I feel as if there's a lot of deep rooted stuff that I would like to address and, and, and feel free of yeah. the pain of the past it's yeah. fucking hard to go back and, and dig up and sometimes you don't want to dig it up because no. you feel as if your life's okay That's I'm just it. scared that maybe a few years it all comes to a head yeah. so I'd probably want to just get it all now while life is good because I don't want to do it if a fucking anything happens and I hit a wobble and then I, ha I feel as if I'm forced to do it why yeah. not do it now when everything's going good? It's, I've always put it off and put it off, but I think this year's, I think this is the time to do that. Like, would you ever dip your toe into speaking to somebody? No. Why? My opinion, no, because I feel my sponsor does a good enough job of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel that fellowship does a good enough job of that. You know, um, I'm actually going through a step four now, which is a personal inventory. You know, doing a, doing a step four round my life and, and, and the shit that I've done, you know, and you've got to write that like no one's ever going to read it. And truth be told, my sponsor's going to read it. And this, and, and, and again, it's, you know, when we were growing up and like with what we known, you wouldn't tell anyone where Beth's nest was. You just, you just didn't do it. You don't speak about your emotions or your feelings. You just don't do it. Men don't do that, you know, but I'm prepared to, to lay it all out because the stuff that I've done, the only I know, you know, you know like some fucking horrendous stuff that, that I know what I've done to get what I needed. No one in my social circle or in anywhere near me knows what I've done. But I've got to write that because, you know, it suffers the most. Me. Because of what I've done. Because of the things I've done. So I'm prepared to write that down to let go of that. And when, my, I, share it, when I share it with my sponsor and he, share, he reads that and, he share, and, he, and we share on that, I'll release that. That'll go. You know, because when I speak to him and say, listen, man, I, I, I'm fucking struggling. You know, I'm not sleeping. I've got guilt and shame around this. I've got that. I've got this. I've got that. My head's done in. And he'll go, put it down. You step four. Get it down. Let go. You know, it's the only way to get rid of all that. All that shit. Because you know yourself. I mean, when a thought resurfaces and you think, why well, I'm not thinking about that. It's going to come back times ten. Mm -hmm. And if you manage to push it down again, it's coming back again with even more vengeance. And that's what it does until a point, until you just go, boop, pop. You know, I understand. I'm not saying counselling is is bad for for you or anyone else. I just don't think it worked for me. You know, what worked for me might not work for you. But that, you know, everyone's walks different. And I just think I would never knock it. Would never slay it. I'd never slag it. I just think I get my own stuff from it through the sponsorship, through my fellowship, and through the the the, the Christian the Christianity and the God stuff that I have going on. Yeah. You know, a lot of people watch this podcast struggle themselves, addiction, mental health, like. How good has your life been since you've changed that? Oh, that's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Don't get me wrong. Listen, life can still be hard. Life on life's terms is hard, isn't it? But I can cope with life on life's terms now because of fellowship. Where, go back 10, 15 years ago, when life got hard, whoosh, that's all I thought about. That's all I thought about. Where now, now I can deal with more shit that comes my way. You know, I can deal with more stuff that comes my way. And I'm telling you now, the best thing I ever done, ever done, up there with having my kids. And the reason why I say that is because the fellowship can give me the ability to be the dad that, I, that they, these kids need. You know, to be the dad that a normal man can be. Man, I'm normal. I have this disease of addiction that I was born with. And it's a brain defect that I was born with. I believe that this addiction and this obsession, this obsessive compulsive disorder that we suffer with, we were born with that. You know, and, and and it has to be treated. It has to be. Go on untreated, it'll kill us. It'll kill us. So I can't stress enough how important it is, James, especially in my life. And for anyone out there who's, who's suffering, Google it. And uh, Google it. It'll bring it up closest. Nycox Anonymous meeting close to me. Psh, go. Just go. Yeah. Yeah. You can throw all your life making changes. Now you're on the YouTube scene, like <laughs> your videos everywhere. You've been fucking standing, being a fair play man for fights. That like, you, you clearly still like fighting. You still, you clearly still like to be around it. It's yeah. in your blood. Yeah. But how are you dealing with like the attention and videos and all the back and forth with everybody? And it's you know what? It's, it's busy. It's, <laughs> it's it's busy. But I love it. 
you know, talking to strangers, meeting new people, you know, connecting with people who are struggling. I only keep what I have by giving it away. You only keep what you have by giving it away. You know, so I can me carrying a message and telling someone, listen, this is this is what works for me. This is what you need to do. Don't think for one second that they don't help me as much as I'm helping them. Because again, you can only keep what you have by giving it away. You know, so it quickly reminds me of why I'm clean, why I go to fellowship, because that's where you've come from, Paul. And that's where you're going to be. You know, and that's not me saying like anyone's in a rock bottom. It's just it's just because I know what it's like to be rock bottom. You know, and anyone wants to reach out to me, I put myself out there now. My YouTube channel is all about, you know, mental health, Nycox Anonymous, you know, and I just share my shit, whether it's good or bad in the morning. You know, I say, I struggled this morning. Getting out, you know, and, and that's all I do. And people to people relate. I make myself vulnerable on there because I don't want anyone to look at me and think he's full of shit him. I want need, need people to know, like, listen, this is exactly what's going through my head. This is exactly how I feel. If you relate to it, drop me a message, man, and we can talk about it. You know, that's that's all I want it to be. I don't want it. Don't get me wrong, I put I shut off a little bit and put a few pad work out on a bit of gym stuff on there, a few fights and that, but yeah, fighting is 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 a passion, man. <clears throat> if if people have got the differences, I would love to see people sorted out in a ring or a cage. You know, uh, with with someone supervising it, where once 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 it's got in too bad, it can be split, it can be sorted. Because I'm, I don't agree with knives, weapons, guns, anything getting used like that. I think anyone who, who, who chooses that route, it's just because they can't fight and because they've got fear of getting there in the fight or whatever. You know, I just think it's a coward's way out. But I May mean, I goes off to anyone who wants to sort the differences out, or even just fight on a charity show, or or, or, or box, or train, or just learn self defence that way. I just think my, that that's the proper way to sort stuff out. You know what I mean? Not only that, it, it, it it's discipline. You know, it, it disciplines you so much that like, like kids should be getting into it now. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, it's meant to watch. It's my mass, it's a passion of mine. I've, I'm actually doing PT level three now. Like I've, I've finished my PT level three, but I'm actually um, working in a Kura Academy now in in Middlesbrough. Um, which is a full MMA gym, you know, I'm doing PT level three in there, I'm, I'm flying in there, it's, it's, it's brilliant, it's a mint environment to be around, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I love it, I love it. Where do you go forward for the future, brother? Forward to the future, next James English. Yes, <laughs> brother. <laughs> where can, what's your links to no. now for people to get in contact, first of all, where can Instagram, Twitter, whatever um, do you use? Instagram, Paul Venice 22 mm -hmm. I've stopped going on Facebook as much because I just get spammed on there. It's a nightmare. Like just spam off the spam off the spam. So I've stopped opening them. I've stopped going on them. So Instagram, Paul Venice 22 and uh, Twitter, Paul Venice and um, YouTube, Paul Venice K1. We'll leave the descriptions for your YouTube and stuff yeah. to get involved. But where, what's the, what's the plans? You're going to be doing podcasts. You're going to be having more fights. Um, to be fair, I'm not too fussed about doing podcasts. I'm not too fussed about doing podcasts. I just want to carry a message, do the odd live, meet some new people, and um, I just carry a message in that Cox Anonymous and my mental health. I'm going to start doing live, so if people want to are in recovery and want to jump on and share their stuff. I'll do a live with you. I'll come on your live. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'll that'd come be on your live. That'd be class, that. Yeah, definitely, bro. Yeah, definitely, I always bro. listen, man. I'm always happy to help out and happy yeah. to push other people's channels. Oh, I'm, in, I'm in a position yeah. now where I can do that, and I genuinely do. I'll leave links, I'll leave things to try and push people to, oh, to try me, and yeah. elevate them to people come on and do their thing but then it's down to them how yeah. far they want to take it like you the wave comes after coming on these podcasts and it's, it's great but then the yeah. wave dies down so it's down to that individual just keep grinding man hustling and if your message is the right message but you can't fool the british public anyway nah. and you're not a man who's who's going to be talking shit anyway so people nah. can see that so yeah people too many people talk the game but six months down the line, 12 months, their mask slips. And people yeah. go, ah, nah, just another one. So yeah. you just go to stay in the path. And you've came through that much to be, to be where you are. And it's unbelievable, man. Like your family will be proud. I'm proud. People watching will be proud. Like some of these podcasts are deep kind of recovery chats, but people don't realise the amount of messages I get for people struggling. Yeah. Uh, physically, emotionally, addicts through drink, drugs, gambling, like, it's all kind of under the same roof, man. We're all kind of, yeah. as you say, it's a disease. It's, it is. We kind of try to figure it all out. And it's okay not to figure it out, but just understand if you're breathing the next day, you can always get up and get do something about it. Bang look up, it. Look up a local meeting, like go and listen. You don't need to speak. A lot of people are scared that they might need to go and speak. No, talk, speak. But just listen yeah. and understand, fuck, I'm not alone. As soon as I Similarities, that, not yeah, the differences. The that's GA all you meeting, yeah. and I used to look and I thought, fuck me, man. Like, 
I'm not the only fucking wrong and in the room, man. Like yeah. He's stealing <laughs> and he's pawning yeah. stuff and I'm thinking, uh, it makes you feel good it because does. you live hope. in that battle that you're scared that... Yeah. That it's nice to know you're not alone, yeah, isn't it? It fills you with hope and faith yeah. because all of a sudden you can hear someone who's, who hasn't gambled for 10 years mm. or hasn't took a drug for 10 years and you think, whoa, how? And yeah. he'll go, because of these. And you think, yes. And mm. it's, it's hope and faith around yeah. it. it. Bang on what you said there, James. If you ever go to these rooms, that can be a scary thing to be like to be in. So you can sit there. Because I remember going to my first meeting thinking, oh my God, look at these lunatics. But that was me, judgmental, you know, not wanting to be there, doing all that shit. Mm. But the moment I started looking for similarities and not the differences, and I started connecting with these people, it was one that I knew. These, I couldn't say no more. Yeah, but you don't understand. If I'd have said that in these rooms, they'd have just laughed because they fucking don't understand. Do you know what I mean? They totally understand. They totally get me. So I thought, yeah, oh, this is uh, me. Yeah. For anybody that's watching, that's maybe going through the struggle themselves, what advice would you have for them? If anyone's struggling with mental health or disease of addiction, first of all, high power. Higher power is massive in my life. You know, I was always told high power can be anything you want it to be. It can be a power. All you've got to do is just believe in a power greater than yourself. I'm thankful I'm grateful that my air power has a name, you know, has a face, which is Jesus Christ. You know, I believe he died for me on, him, on that cross so I could go to heaven. Nicox Anonymous, it will set you free from the disease of addiction. It will set you free from your active addiction, which is taking drugs. The obsessive and compulsion to use drugs will be lifted, you know, and that's all you've got to do. All you've got to do is put 100% effort in. Put half effort in to Nicox Anonymous than you do to score on your next hit. Trust me, you'll have a good life. A life beyond your wildest dreams. Brother, for coming on today and telling your story. Yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank Stay you. strong and keep changing lives. God bless, mate. Thank God you. Bless.